Welcome to the Entertainment Engine. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Entertainment Engine. My name is Peter Moore. And I'm Bex Gregory. And just to recap, the idea behind this podcast is to provide clarity and information on the entertainment business for new bands and artists entering the industry, as well as existing creative people as well, who are looking to maybe brush up on some of their knowledge. The entertainment industry is a great passion of ours, and we're looking forward to sharing our knowledge and experience with you all. You can also listen on your favourite platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, CastBox, Radio Public, plus many, many more. In our weekly podcast show, we will be bringing an in-depth area of the entertainment industry. And this week, we'll be looking at how to set up a DIY record label. Also, over the coming weeks, we will be bringing some really great guests onto the show from the world of entertainment. So stay tuned. And later on in today's show, we're going to be having some really cool facts from Bex. And after the facts of the day, we'll then move on to the latest entertainment news from music, film and TV from around the globe. We then finish the show with a question of the day for our listeners. OK, we're now going to take a look at how to set up a DIY record label. And DIY means do it yourself. And also just want to start off this session by... Um, Thanking everybody for listening to the past few podcasts, which Becky and I have just launched. Um, so we're really grateful for that and we look forward to you coming on our journey with us. Another sort of thing I wanted to add is me touching on the record company and how to set one up is sort of how I started really back in the day, which you've heard me say a few times now. So I am just wanted to run through this session. Um, we'll be covering a few points on how to set up your own label and we're also going to cover it in the next podcast session as well so it's going to be sort of structured over two podcasts and hopefully you'll be able to go away with some good points and some interesting information to continue on your journey to um, help you set up your record company so just touching on what I mentioned earlier it was actually how I started and um, just a brief little story for me it was a case of my dad didn't want me to um, work on the farm I grew up on a farm and um, yeah I always wanted to you know sort of do that go and drive tractors and you know do that thing and my dad was like well there's not really any money in it so I thought okay you know what else can I do really and I always had a big passion for the record industry and I just basically got off my backside and hounded the streets of you know many cities London mainly to try and find a job and after a sort of a long long time of getting told no I finally um, got a job and it was you know really interesting I delivered the mail to people make ups of tea for people um, I, I went from that label to a subsidiary of Sony um, which sold dance records back in the sort of mid 90s and I sort of I really cut my teeth on how the label works how the promotional arm works how distribution works I got an inkling to how finance works, how to deal with artists. So it was a really good education and you know, I'm grateful for that experience. So this is what I'm going to share with you today. So let's get going. Today, really, I would say a label is pretty much open for anyone to set up. I, I, I don't think it's the, the barriers of entry, are, you know, are not that great to what they used to be. Um, and you always hear someone set up a label and say, oh, I've got a record company. Is it that easy? There's always good and bad points in anything that you do, and um, many of the best labels you know today that have been set up, they've they've made it up as they go along. And that's definitely for sure. There isn't one label or company out there that says, "Oh, you know, they've got the golden goose and they know how to sort of this is going to work from day one." You don't. So you sort of live as you go along and you learn as you go along. And we all make mistakes, but I think if you've got a good structure, then you know that's 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 the key really structure knowledge make a few mistakes have a lot of bumps in the road you know then then you're always good to go if you want a, the best chance of success really when you're setting up your label or your investment which you've may have pulled in from friends and family or you may be lucky with an investor you really need to go through a proper setup process it's fundamental and as it's an indie label I'm sort of guessing and looking at that a lot of indie labels will basically 
you know, ride in the, on their backside effectively and, and maybe miss things and not look at doing things. So hopefully this will just give you, you know, a bit more food for thought where you think, oh, actually, I must put that in place. Um, so I think it's, I think this is really important to cover. It's really critical you go into this with your eyes wide open. Let's look at a few points to consider. If you are starting a label, uh, really for the sole purpose of releasing your own music, then really that could be looked at as a vanity project. So, and distributors won't particularly like it either. So even with the best intentions, you're running the risk of coming across as a vanity project. So be really, really careful about that. Um, even though you're setting up a label, it's it's just maybe wise to look at what you're trying to achieve and structure within um, within the label that you're doing. It just means some distributors may be hesitant to work with you and some funding sources might be a bit hesitant because of they're seeing it as well. I'm not quite sure. Have you got any other releases? You know, are you doing any in-house promotion? It can be really a little uncomfortable for everyone. You're calling upon even journalists asking them to review stuff and it's they see it as well. You're just releasing your own music through your own sort of la label really, which I'll just sort of be aware of that and, and maybe look at fr from day one what you're looking to try to achieve. This isn't to say you shouldn't start a label to release your own music. It just means you should be aware of really the complications that, that maybe other labels won't face. You almost certainly have to work your label on every single day, even if you have a full-time job. So it, it's going to be juggling a lot of things that you would normally do. It's a big commitment. Um, do you have the time to invest in making the labour work? That's what you've got to ask yourself. How much really are you going to be budgeting? What sort of relationships have you got with, you know, we know that you, with your family is going to be great and there isn't really going to be any issues with that, but what relationship have you got with the bank manager? Have you dealt with a bank manager before? What relationship have you got with any private investors? You know, these, these, these sort of questions that you're going to have to ask yourself and you're going to have to go down the road and effectively see what answers you get, but it's it's going to be a certainly an interesting journey and when you look at starting a label are you going to be able to cover your bills so there's lots of things that you need to do and i'm i'm going to be doing another podcast on sort of basic business plan structure and how to raise money and the best way of going about it and it's still no guarantee but it, there's certainly some good points that i can um, do in a future podcast about raising money and it's something that i've been through many 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 times and um had loads of no's but I've also had quite a few yeses so um, it's just if you're coming into this you need to go into it with your eyes really wide open. So let's start by looking at some practical tips and ideas and really how to set up your label and the first point really is again choosing your business structure and label name. Now many indies will skip this step at least to begin with but it's a good idea to have your record label set up as a legal entity from the start. And this is where you should really go and get advice from an accountant or you maybe have an attorney that you know just so that you're on the right road to begin with because it's you could set this up down the road and you haven't had the proper advice and you start coming up against hurdles that's the first thing that i would certainly you know need to look at especially if you're going to be setting up a legal business and and you want to actually you know have a business bank account and you want to have a credit card you're just going to need to have the proper advice and you're also going to have the account to be set up to pay for tax as well so it's just going to be more manageable for you working this way if you even if you're applying for a business loan or any kinds of funding from private structure equity private investors it needs to be a legal business and you need to have a strong business plan as i said there'll be more about this coming in future weeks but you really do need to come to the table with your a game because it's really really important and even you know i've touched on covid a few times um in the last podcast and it is really important everyone's going to have to come to the table with their a game and be even more focused on what you're doing and just have been able to answer the question that you need to be able to answer it's just going to be really really important and especially dealing with banks and dealing with private investors they are going to put you through the ringer and they're going to ask you questions you don't want to answer and you're going to have to have the answers or at least if you haven't got the answer you can say well i haven't got that answer but i can get back to you and you need to look at names and specific you know variants of the business framework they will differ from country to country so if you're setting up a label in the uk and you need to work in the us that's going to be a different structure there is it going to be a, 
you know, a partnership? Are you going to be a, a sole proprietor or are you going to set up a limited company? These are the things that you will go through with your accountant and attorney and you will get best advice on, on what to do. And, and where is the company going to be domiciled? You know, is it the UK? Is it Europe? Is it the US? Um, they're the types of answers that you would need to be looking at for when you looking at structuring your label. Um, so you need to spend some time and your computer and learning about uh, looking at some of the laws in your area. Even though you can go through this with your attorney, it's still important for you to be able to sort of look at what structure you would need to be doing. And even going in with an idea to your accountant saying, oh, actually, I think, you know, there's me and my partner. Maybe we should have this structure and it should be a limited company or it should be a partnership. You are certainly then going in with, with some good ideas and your accountant and attorney will um, come back with some strong advice for you as well. So I think that's that's certainly one to certainly think about. Also, next sort of point looking to cover in the label. If you're starting the label, you know, you may need a partnership agreement. And these will detail a percentage of, of ownership, um, who gets what, um, how each partner works in the business, how decisions are made within the partnership. This is really, really important. I can't emphasize this enough because that bit of paper can determine you know the future of of your label and just to give you sort of a, a, a bit more on that if you don't have an agreement and you go and sign an artist and that artist goes into stratosphere and sells millions and millions of records and does massive tours all around the world and you haven't got a bit of paper in place with an attorney or your accountant and it hasn't been structured properly you're going to have all sorts of problems because then you're going to be arguing who's paid what who's owed what it just becomes really 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 messy and with that bit of paper signed, sealed and delivered, no one can argue. And it's just protecting you, protecting the artist, just protecting everybody that you're working with. And also it just makes you better sleep better at night. It just It's just perfect sense, really. And also depending on where you live, as we said earlier, those laws associated to your business could change. So this is how a partnership agreement could differ. Or you may need to devise a completely separate agreement. And that, again, will come down to you having a conversation with um with your attorney and with your accountant to really solidly come out with those answers and what it will do is just in those few conversations of you just looking at being able to set up a a record company with your buddies um it will certainly determine who actually wants to stay forward for the journey and who actually wants to leave and that's not a bad thing if you all want to walk away because you think oh, that's a bit too much then that's not a bad decision to make but if you don't have the knowledge and information in front of you, you cannot make an informed decision. And I think for most indies, most of them fly by the seat of their pants. I have to begin with. You, you do because you haven't got the resources and the money that like a big major label would have. So you have to do things on the cheap or you have to do things that you, you, you couldn't quite you know manage to do. So you have to think of another way around it. So look at the best business structure. And, and the ones that really work are the are probably the most simplest and it protects the partners from any personal liability should something go wrong in the business. Um, this is also the time to look at how the company would operate. So who would be responsible for what, as we spoke about earlier, who's going to do what job, so who's going to take care of distribution, who's going to take care of um, the PR, who's going to actually going to deal with the artists on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if these issues are not addressed like we said then you're gonna have problems way way down the line because you go from one artist to 15 you know you suddenly got quite a big indie label that's you know producing and releasing quite a lot of music you need a structure in place um so it's it's paramount that you really look at these issues before you go in with both feet really and do as much research as possible ask as many questions as you possibly can talk to your accountant about them talk to your attorney just basically go and talk to everybody um, because the more knowledge and information you have at that point, then the better informed decision you are going to be able to make before you actually set up your label. Um, you know, do it online. It, it's just, it, it will give you peace of mind and it'll make you feel a whole lot better when you actually go through the process. Okay, now we're just going to look at sort of the next point, which is one of the most exciting bits, is finding the music for the label. What sort of music are you going to be releasing within the label is it going to be rock is it going to be pop is it going to be country is it going to be hip-hop is it going to be dance w whatever the genre is that's why you got into actually setting up the label because you believe in the genre that you're in you believe in that music and it really really excites you so i think you know that's a really positive thing to do and to be honest with you 
you could be having the, the next music that just touches the world and everyone wants to buy so you just you just never never know where it's going to be coming from if you have an idea for the, the music that you want to do um and now's the time but you're not quite sure and you have a release or you don't have a release try and line up as many releases as you possibly can because then you're just going back to it's not a vanity project so you're actually looking at more and more music that's going to be pretty much on a conveyor belt to come you know to come out really and i think finding the music can be harder than it sounds and it can be a bit like finding the needle in a haystack but if you're already a musician and you're, and you're already got your ear to the ground you will be able to find the right music that suits you and that could be from you know clubs pubs um it could be from uh, you know review that you see and it could be from information you get from bands on a weekly basis it could be from another manager that says actually this band are really good you need to check them out um could be from an agent attorney accountant it, it will come from all sorts of places but just don't jump into the first one that you want to do a release with because sometimes that can be a mistake and then you've got to obviously find distributor you've got to find the, the public relations and you've got to find the social media so don't just jump in with two feet until you've actually sort of um you know looks at your p's and q's and making sure you're going in the right direction and just sort of going over this again one of the easiest things you can do is start locally you know go and check out local musicians you start knocking on doors there'll be many many musicians that will start to bite your hand off so that won't really be an issue and just sort of be busy make a nuisance of yourself go and talk to everybody and you will find the act that you want to sort of release their music also as well when you're online Massive resources online now. You can look at MySpace. I know that's a lot older than back in the day, but it's still worth looking on MySpace for actually. You've got Bandcamp, you've got Reverb Nation. Talk to your accountant, talk to a lawyer. Um, there'll be loads of other websites for unsigned bands and artists, so check all them out as well. Um, and really, you got into this because you love the music, and an indie label really is a labour of love. So it's really important to hold out for the music that you really, really believe in. Don't just put anything out there because it will not only damage you, it would damage your investors, it would damage your reputation, and that's really not a space where you want to be in. So when you've decided to start a label, you can feel like it's pretty urgent to just put the music out now, and that's what we got to do, and we just need to do that. In the long run, waiting to have the right record that you love to bring to the world is going to be worth it. So you, you're going to go through a big sifting process, but it will be worth it to be able to do that, because then you're going to find the right music that what you really want to do. That's all for part one. I'll be back to you in a few short moments. I'm now going to pass you over to Bex as she's got some really cool facts of the day. Facts of the day. Hi everyone, I've got two really cool music facts for this week. Okay, so this first one is about Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is You, which set the Guinness World Record for the most streamed track on Spotify in 24 hours. It attracted 10.9 million Spotify streams on December the 24th during the 2018 holiday season, which is more than two decades ago. And the artist who actually smashed the all-time record is Ariana Grande, with the Spotify 24-hour record with nearly 15 million streams of her new track, Seven Rings. So that's like 4 million plays bigger than what Mariah Carey did previously. I mean, it's just amazing. And I mean, that was huge at the time. So there's some really interesting stuff there. And I will be sharing another fact a little bit later on in the show. But just before I hand you back to Pete, I just wanted to remind you guys that we are on all major platforms. So you can listen to us and subscribe on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast and many, many others. But you can actually find that out on anchor.fm forward slash entertainment engine. And we'll be happy to, you know, answer any questions that you have or anything like that. So always just feel free to drop us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so now it's back to Pete to discuss more about how to set up a DIY label. Let's continue on the next part of your journey of setting up your own record label. The first points we sort of covered would sort of get you up and running, looking at your legal part, looking at your, your accountant part and looking at you know, what songs you're going to be selecting and sort of taking you through the process, really. And th this next part is, again, really uh, exciting and, and really interesting because you're sort of moving forward and you're looking at what music you're wanting to release. So 
Let's now look at sort of the independent label contracts, the sort of framework you need, the artists and the band deals that you're going to look to do. So once you know what the music you're going to release and you've had sort of you've had a few arguments with your mates or your partners about what who thinks what music should go out and what should be the first single, what should be the first album, and you've all made that decision, which is great. So you really need to set up the artist deals and you need to know exactly what you're going to offer each artist before you release any music. It, it should be ironclad and it should be quite an easy structure to do because you should have already discussed this with your accountant and your attorney and you should already have an idea of what you want to do as well because you you know you've been in the business a while and you know you should have sort of an idea of a structure and if not you know you're just coming into the business then please do take advice from your accountants and your attorneys and, and sort of be a sponge with as, as much information you can get so you can um, make really good informed decisions and the one thing really good thing with an indie label is that you can essentially structure any kind of deal that you want you're not tied to a, to a major label you're not tied to a, a big company no it's you you and your buddies got together to develop you know a really good label that you want to release music that you know not only you like you hope that the world's going to like so you try and make it as simple and as easy process as you possibly can it make life a lot easier to create the deal that works for you and you can do it on an artist by artist deal basis so you don't have to sort of you know roll out 20 acts in one go it's it's you know that would just be a bit silly really you've got to know your limitations and look at some of the basic principles in mind so that we you can move forward then in a really positive way so look at this look at some of these things to think about when when we're moving forward how you're going to work with the musician now from a label perspective do you want the musicians to actually deliver a full finish master or are you going to cover the recording costs now that part should be in your business plan already you should already know how much you can afford to do how much you you afford you can't do so that's really sort of the first point here then we're looking at advances and that's really a you know pain advances that's got a scary word and i think I don't know whether advances are paid anymore to be perfectly honest to artists i think the industry's changed so much over time it i'm not sure but if you are looking at paying advances if so how much are you looking to pay you probably might not have you might only have 10 quid in the budget you might have a hundred thousand you might have a million you just got to look at what you're trying to do and try and keep your advances to the bare minimum if you can because you won't have any money left for promotion you're not a major label you know you haven't got massively deep pockets so you want to try and do everything you possibly can on a budget but in a really productive and and good way so just really think about that if you do want to pay advances and, and if you do how much that's going to be and going on to the next point it, you know how will the your earnings from the label release be divided up you know what percentage of that will the artist get are you splitting it 50 50 is it 70 30 90 10 60 40 will your label recoup all the manufacturing costs and promotional costs before you pay that act that's again another really important thing that you need to look at because you know you could be paying money out or you will be paying money out left right and center and you could end up with nothing so when it comes to your annual review for your bank manager and your investors and even your buddies that have invested in you and you, you know you're going cap in hand with no money they're going to ask you why and they're going to ask you why did you not take that advice from the attorney why did you not set that up properly with your accountant these are all things that are going to come and bite you on the backside so you really really need to take all the advice and knowledge you can so that you're going to minimize you know your mistakes we all make them i've made loads of them but the more you minimize then the better chance you've got of actually sort of you know winning really and still staying with the artist what sort of promotional expenditure are you gonna you know ascertain really and and to approve if so how much are the, are the artists going to get a certain amount of promotional expenditure um what sort of budget are you going to put there is the label going to take care of it is it going to be you know a 50 50 deal with the artist again just need something to really think about there and when you produce the product physical product you know how many promos and free copies will you give the artist to actually go and promote and over that limit how many would they pay for additional copies again that's quite an important thing because you might sort of you know do a limited release of a couple of thousand albums and you might give you know two or three hundred to the artist to go and promote now that's all cost you to do that or it's cost you both to do that you just need to weigh that up about what's a sensible 
break even point and you know you're happy with it you're going to be able to do and the other thing as well with artists look at the length of the deal what deal are you going to do with this artist and i'll tell you now no artist is going to want to be with you if they don't like you and the same with you if you don't like the artist you're not going to stay with them you need to have a clear understanding with that act about what you're going to do and even if you you know you're chasing for the stars and you get to the moon and whatever you want to do as long as you've got a structure they will be happy with you and you'll be happy with them so you know you could look at say one single deal to begin with you could look at two singles you could look at two single deals in an album or three albums just be sensible about what you're offering and why you're offering it and and be careful with your limitations as well one thing that i certainly learn is if you sort of go into something with your eyes shut you're never really going to come out winning so you really need to go into it with your eyes open and always over deliver and under promise and that way you're, you're you've got a good sounding to, to move forward will you do a publishing deal will you look at tying the artist in with a publishing deal as well um and this is a whole different type of subject and it's something that we will be speaking about in future podcasts with some of my colleagues around the world that are superbly experienced in in the publishing community so that that's certainly going to be a great podcast to um to look out for in the coming weeks now this is another interesting bit to really look at as well when you sign an artist and let's just say you've got you know several artists on your on the on the roster and they're all doing really really well usually a musician is entitled to audit your books at a certain period of time how often are you going to allow this um, what sort of period of notice are you going to be able to do with this? To a point, it only really happens when you get to a certain size. Um, but you still need to bear this in mind because, you know, you could sold several million copies of an album and that artist isn't happy with their, where their revenue streams come in and they're going to want to ask you to open the books. I believe the limit for actually opening the books is seven years. That may have changed. Certainly is with a major label. But again, it's something to consider because you're going to get caught up in with your team of releasing music and time will go by and before you know it it you know things will creep up on you so just bear that in mind about how you structure that and how often you would actually let an artist you know come and audit the books if if you needed to do that and be careful as well because if you do do that and you do need an auditor to come in to do that they're probably going to charge you up front they might want a percentage of the back end it just depends on what type of deal you structure but just again it's just be mindful of this area um, and just sort of go into it with your eyes open and try and take all the advice you can. It's, it's something that will, you know, potentially could happen down the road. Just, you know, bear that bit in mind. Now we going on to sort of point four, really. And this is look, figuring out how you're going to distribute your music. So when you actually set your label up, you've had your advice from your attorney, your accountant, you've found... The music that you want to release you've got your social media campaign your twitter your instagram and now you want to sort of find your distribution and to be fair you want to start talking to distributors at the beginning about what you're actually doing don't talk to them at the end because they're going to think well, where have you come from why the hell do we need to be talking to you now when you should have been speaking to them at the beginning and distribution is a chicken and egg it's a real real difficult one it's distributors will want to know if you have music ready to go before they will commit to working with you doing anything not in all cases but in some cases musicians are going to want to know do you have distribution before they sign to a label so they're going to want to know that so it's it's a two-way process and it's really really difficult you're the one who's juggling with many situations and to be fair the band are concentrating on playing live and making great music you know but you're concentrating on a multitude of things and distribution is really really key to actually making sure that people you know are going to hear your music so sometimes when you start on an indie label one time musicians will, will you know will want to come on board before you find distribution there, there will be the answer no i'll give you a go and i think everybody's got to start from somewhere and that's probably a, a great case or your best scenario if you can get this all lined up there's not much you know you can try to keep juggling a little bit of work here a little bit of soft commitments there but if you can manage to get that first act to say okay i'll go with you then you know you're on you're on to a a, a nice platform and looking at distribution really it, it, it's much easier to find 
sort of distribution online than it is physical distribution, just for the nature where the industry has changed over the years. Um, you've got aggregating services like Record Union, you've got TuneCore, um, music sites that go through to Amazon, um, iTunes, Pandora. It's a lot more easier now where you can actually set your label up from your laptop. Um, you can go through those aggregators, can position your music to actually be released. So that that's certainly a really good space to be in. Physical, obviously, what's happened over the years with um, the sort of demise of CDs. We know physical distribution is, you know, coming back with vinyl, which is still a great a great thing to do. And you know, I'm I'm really pleased about that. But really, digital distribution is, um, you know, pretty huge now. And you can set up these services, as I said, quite easily. And you can move, um, you can you can adjust what you do. You can actually, you haven't got to go to a third party to actually, you know, run your website. You can actually do it all from all from your own laptop. And I think that's a really good um, a good space to be in. One of the other sites that uh, digital site that's been set up is Amuse, which I think is really quite an interesting platform. Which I believe the co-founder is Will I Am with Diego Farris. So. I think, you know, budding bands and musicians out there, just check that platform out because I know some of the, the acts that I've worked with and know are using that platform. So, again, just go and have a look and whatever you feel is, is suitable for you, then, um, you know, take a look at it. Some physical distributors will work with anyone, but your ideal situation is to land a distributor with a company that sort of is selective about the labels they work with because they're going to want to see if you've got four, five, six releases coming that companies they will actually get involved with and in selling your release to store and will often help you advertise that release. Now, there's a double-edged sword to that because if if they're footing up the bill to advertise, you know, your album in store or online, then there's obviously a cost to that. So you need to look at your, your cash flow and how that's actually going to work for your label. These sorts of companies want to know that your release schedule is planned. They don't like working with a label that just has one release. So you're going to have to sort of prove that, you know, you've got sort of a series of up and coming releases coming out, whether that's singles or, um, you know, full albums, so that they've got more of a chance of, you know, recouping their money and obviously you making money. So it's like it's a two way approach as well. Some distributors sometimes often offer an M&D deal, which is manufacturing and distribution deals in which they pay for all the manufacturing upfront and recoup it from the sales of the CDs. It helps with your cash flow really in the short term, but these deals are becoming more and more of rarity due to really the changing landscape of the whole music industry and what's happened over the past several years. So I think really it's just being mindful of, of what you're going into. And again, I was I was always taught that you know, knowledge is power and information is key. And I think the more you learn, on your journey and the more information you have you can make a better informed decision no one's saying anything is impossible but it becomes impossible if you haven't got the right structure and the right path and i think if you sort of have a tick box and you you know you're ticking a few of those those boxes off then you you're looking in a, in a stronger position and again you may want to set up the label at that point you may not want to it's just depending on what, what situation and how you feel at that time about what you want to do so um really this is all for part one to the DIY label for this week but we will be looking at part two of setting up your label next week's podcast show so really don't miss that one and one of the areas we will be looking at is preparing for your first record release so I look forward to talking to you more about that next week and now I'm going to be passing over to Bex as she's got another fact of the day facts of the day Thanks for that, Pete. Yes, so we've got the second fact of the day for you. And anyone who loves live music shows, festivals and concerts, you're going to love this next fact. So the artist that hosted the largest ever free concert was Rod Stewart. And the concert took place in Rio de Janeiro, Copacabana Beach in Brazil on New Year's Eve 1993. And it remains the most attended free concert ever. And according to the Guinness World Records, it's estimated that there was 4.2 million that attended. And actually, the second most attended free concert was Jean-Michel Jarre's, which was at the University of Moscow on September the 6th, 1997, which estimated an audience of 3.5 million. I mean, that must have been amazing to have attended that. 
probably the biggest festival that I've attended was the Victorious Festival, which was about 70, 80,000 people when the Mannix headlined. Yeah, and I mean, that was big enough. But thanks for listening, guys, and I hope you found some of those facts interesting. I know that I found them really interesting. But I'm just going to hand you over to Pete. But before I go, please remember that we are actually available on all major platforms. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. So you can always leave us a review um, as we'd love to hear your feedback. That'd be awesome. And if you do share and spread the word on social media, you know, that would be really, really great. And we would thank you so much for that. But if you do that, just remember to put hashtag the entertainment engine so that we can find you and thank you entertainment news and we now look at the global music news this week i just wanted to take a little bit more of a a different tact and actually pay my respects to one of the most respected and legendary composers of all time enyon morricone who sadly passed away july 6 2020 morricone was born in rome on the 10th of november 1928 his long artistic career includes a wide range of composition genres, working as an orchestrator, conductor, and composer for theatre, radio, and cinema. His score to The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly in 1966 is still considered one of the most influential soundtracks of all time and was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. His filmography includes over 70 award-winning films all Sergio Leone's films since A Fistful of Dollars, and all Giuseppe Torotano's films since Cinema Paradiso, The Battle of Algiers, Exorcist 2, as well as The Thing, Once Upon a Time in America, The Mission, The Untouchables, Bugsy, Disclosure, In the Line of Fire, Ripley's Game, and The Hateful Eight, just to name a few. Marconi composed over 400 scores for cinema and television, as well as over 100 classical works. He will surely sadly be missed, a true legend. For me, working in the music industry with no music in film just doesn't make sense. The music does make the movie, and I'm sure many people out there will agree with me. Just a wonderful, wonderful person, and leaves a legacy of amazing soundtracks. Okay, now we're going to take a look a legendary songwriter and nominated Grammy music producer with over five decades in the music business, Mr. Alan Glass. We have known Alan for many, many years and he's just an absolutely wonderful person and huge amount of respect and experience within the business. Alan is a true, true legend. Born in New Orleans, Alan absorbed a rainbow of musical styles from that amazing and exciting city over many years. With the exotic mix which informs his love of all genres of music and his hit song writing credits totally reflect this. From soul to country, to rock to dance and even to opera. Who would have thought of that? Alan's credits include writing with Aretha Franklin, Al Green, to Kenny G, Earth, Wind and Fire and more recently Liberty X and Mystique plus countless songs which he's done for X Factor winners all over Europe. Alan's film credits also include Another 48 Hours with Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy, the animation film for Disney Hercules back in 1997 and also he wrote some music for the movie Virtuosity starring Denzel Washington. Alan was mentored in production by the Philadelphian legend Tom Bell as well as Morris White from Earth, Wind and Fire. An outstanding career and I'm really looking forward because Alan will be joining me on the show in the coming weeks to discuss his creative approach to writing hit songs and crafting killer productions and of course Alan's going to be discussing the real side of the music business which I am really looking forward to. It's going to be great and I'm going to keep you posted when that one comes along. Thanks a lot and now we're going to move on to the global film news. Now This is one film a lot of people are going to be really eager to see, including me. James Bond, No Time to Die, is Daniel Craig's final outing as the double agent. Really excited. When the coronavirus outbreak, COVID-19, began to spread across the globe, one of the first movies to announce it would delay its release was No Time to Die. 
long-awaited final outing for Daniel Craig as the double agent James Bond. This means by the time that fans are finally able to see this movie, which is set to be Craig's last as the iconic double agent James Bond, more than five years would have passed since Spectre's release in cinemas. Amazing! And it's not just the pandemic that has led to this movie's delay. There have been production difficulties all along the way, with none bigger when original director Danny Boyle stood aside from the project and was replaced by Carrie Fuganaga. So, who is in No Time To Die? As well as Daniel Craig in the final appearance as James Bond, Ralph Fiennes plays M, Leah Sudeau plays Madeline Swan, Naomi Harris as Miss Moneypenny, Ben Whishaw as Q, Rory Kinnear as Bill Tanner, and Jeffrey Wright as Felix Leiter will all be in their reprising roles for the new movie. If all had gone according to plan, we'd have seen the film by now and no doubt had a lot of talking points to discuss with us all. But the release is now scheduled for November the 12th in cinemas. We've just got to wait that little bit longer, guys. Now, this one film is for me and I'm not missing this. It's going straight on the calendar. So get your drinks ready. Mine's shaken, not stirred. Grab your popcorn, sit back and enjoy. In a safe way, of course. More on the movie and music news next week. And now I'm going to pass over to Bex for this week's question of the day. Okay, so for this week's question of the day, who became the youngest solo artist of all time to win Album of the Year at the Grammys in January 2020? So if any of you listeners think you do know the answer, please send us a message at anchor.fm forward slash entertainment engine and click on the message feature to send in your answers for a chance to be featured on next week's show and just to recap the answer to last week's question which was what was the music video to first air on mtv august the 1st 1981 and the answer is video killed the radio star by the buggles and I just want to say thanks to everybody who sent in their answers for last week's question. And I just wanted to actually thank Maggie who called in, who left us a lovely message. And I know she's a big fan of the song. So um, here's a little message she left for us because she got the answer right. Thank you so much. This is Maggie from Hampshire in England. I believe I have the right answer for your question last week. And it was Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles. They were quite it was a good band in their day and everyone was singing the song. It was quite hilarious. Well, that's all for today's episode of The Entertainment Engine and thanks for listening. Join us again next week when we talk more about the entertainment industry and delve into part two of a DIY record label for musicians, bands and creative people who just want to learn more about the entertainment industry. Plus, we will have all the latest news and updates from the music and film sectors with the majors and the indies. And we'll also have more facts of the day and another question of the day for our listeners. So it'd be great to have your feedback on the show. We would really, really love that. So you can always drop us a message at any time. That would be really cool. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast on anchor.fm forward slash entertainment engine so you never miss an episode. Stay safe, and thanks for listening. The Entertainment Engine.